Okay, so I'm gonna start this off a little different. So we're gonna do five things in 10 seconds. So I'm going to give you, Paul, five things. You're going to have to name off five things in whatever category I'm giving you. And then you're going to give Kyle a category. He's going to do 10 seconds and he's going to give me a category. Okay? Are you ready, Paul? I, I really don't, know. <laughs> don't you know. know what you're doing, so I don't know. Sure. But. So if I was kind, I would say, Paul, five hockey teams in 10 seconds. But I'm not going to do that. That's a little too nice. Uh, we'll go adjacent. To, okay, Paul, five baseball teams in 10 seconds. Yeah. Toronto Blue Jays, New York Yankees, New York Mets, Oakland A's, LA Dodgers, Montreal Expos, even though they no longer exist. Well, that's it. I mean, should have been harder on him. Okay, now you give Kyle. Five hockey teams. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> go, five hockey teams. Pass. <laughs> you gotta get that brain working today. Come on. All right, we'll give him something else so he, we can start the timer. Get ready. Oh, okay, I'll be I'll be a little more generous with me. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Five preachers. Five, just five preachers. Homer Haley. Can they be living preachers? You only have four right. Scott Young, Kyle Goodwin. N- not yourself. <laughs> you only have three too. All right, Kyle, give me a topic. Uh, why am I? I? I was just thrown off because of of the timing. I was sure. on the timer as well. well I'm, I'm, a pre- I'm a preacher. Why doesn't, why doesn't my name count? <laughs> totally counts. I didn't put any rules. All right. Um, five Canadian provinces. Stop. Oh. I would have no idea. Come on. Something. Wait, wait, relative. wait, wait. Five Canadian provinces? All right, go ahead. Um, Toronto. That's a city. <laughs> Damn. Uh, no, I mean, Edmonton. That's a city. <laughs> <laughs> oh, John. Why would I know? John. Provinces. Because it's our neighbor to the north. But it's Do you amazing. know any states? I, mean, I don't look over can you my neighbors. A, a Canadian saying what? It's rude to look California? over your neighbor's fence, okay? It's rude to look over there and see what they're doing, okay? All right, all right, all right. It's their thing. Okay, Let them here, do their okay. thing. Five different breeds of dog. Um, Golden Retriever, Labrador, uh, Pomeranian, Pitbull, and Standard Poodle. Okay, fun. All right. Welcome to the Exhorter Podcast. We're so glad that you could join us this morning. Our goal is always to stir up love and good works through bite-sized biblical discussion. We try to get interesting topics, things that we are interested in talking about that we hope you are too. John, you are bringing our topic this morning. What are we talking about? So my head is focused around uh, a lot these days around the idea of building relationships. And we're working on bringing back group meetings to our congregation And I'm generally just a strong advocate that strong relationships in Christ are essential to individuals as well as strong bodies of Christ. So let's talk about godly relationships this morning. Um, There are several topics I want to talk about in here over probably different episodes. But today let's focus on godly relationships with unbelievers. We're going to take our lead from 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What argument has a temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be the sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Okay. So we're given this interesting little analogy here, which m- might have actually been the the actual name of this episode, unequally yoked. But uh, I didn't know if anyone would know what that means. So, you know, uh, I was actually asking people uh, this week <laughs> what they think that means. And I don't think everyone really understands. It. It's not something we use every day. So first question up there for you guys is uh, what, what does it mean to be unequally yoked? Was that phrase? So I sent you both a cartoon yesterday, but for the audience, it was a picture of two eggs in a pan. Uh, one of them had a really large yolk and the other had a really small. 
and it said, I can't date you. We are unequally yoked. I don't think that's what we're talking about here today. <laughs> no. Uh, when we talk about yoke, because that's not a word that we use as much yet. It's a word that's in the Bible a lot. So I guess the first question is, what is a yoke? It's not an egg yoke. No, it's not a yoke. We're talking about what? We are in the number one egg county in the nation. So we you are. Know. And so this is the wood cross beam that attaches two oxen to a plow. There you go. All right. And what is the idea of the unequal? You mean like one side is one side of the yoke is bigger than the other or what? Well, when when we take a look at the Greek, it's it's a challenging word to translate. I think it's I'm going off memory here. Heterozygontes or something like that. Hetero meaning different. But an easy way to figure out usage for this word, like I said, this is the only place in the New Testament where you find that specific Greek word. However, when you look at the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, this word does pop up in Leviticus 19, and it talks about that. You're not going to put an ox with a goat, for example, as a team, because one's going to pull much harder and do all the work and have to pick up the slack for the the smaller goat. And I I think some translations, uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible does a good job saying, do not be mismatched with unbelievers. So I think that's a pretty good way to understand it. Yeah. And, and I think Deuteronomy as well, they're commanded and they're told not to, to put an ox in with a donkey. You see what I did there, John? What, when, when you get a Greek word or a confusing name in the Bible, say it with confidence. Say it with confidence. You, you, know, yeah, you, you might have gone to college and studied Greek. Sure, they, never they, know. No one knows. Except say it with confidence. That, except for the fact that you mention all the time. That if you, you did should. go to college and study Greek, then you see what a fraud I am. But <laughs> exactly. for those of you that didn't, yeah, I look pretty smart. If they did this, if they if they put an oxen with a smaller oxen or a donkey or another animal, they would find one animal would control or dominate the other and send them off course in the wrong direction, and the field would not get plowed. It would not be productive to do this, right? And I like the terminology, control or dominate over, because they're both going to have effort. They're both going to be strong, but they're just not at the same pace. They're not the same strength and level, right? You you, you mentioned uh, the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 22 and verse 10, talking about not plowing with an ox and a donkey together. I think the Bible, you know, gets this imagery. I think in New Testament Christians, when they read this, it would have been, oh, yeah, I know exactly what yeah. you mean as soon as they read it, because it, it's it's almost a, a funny picture. An ox and a donkey would have been ridiculous. You've got the ox, like you said, that's powerful. They're designed for this. We're a donkey not known for that. So you're going to be you're going to see them probably going all over the place. It's an imbalance of power and purpose. And that's kind of what they're illustrating in this yeah. passage. Well, so let's continue to break this down. What what do we mean by a non-believer from this passage? That would be someone who does not believe. Okay. What's the Greek say? <laughs> What's the Greek say on that one, Kyle? <laughs> I don't know. The English is pretty clear on this one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're talking. Are we talking about someone, anyone who has not become a Christian? Well, what do we mean, what do we mean by Christian? A lot of people that would say they're Christian that I I hear the things they teach and believe and I say, what Bible are you reading? I think by looking at the whole passage, it defines itself by talking about complete opposites when it's when it's talking about, you know, what harmony has Christ with Belial, which is like worthlessness. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about not being bound together with unbelievers, then it's the exact opposite of believe, you know, believers and unbelievers together is exactly what it means. You, you know, you, it's somebody who has a purpose and believes in what Jesus Christ has given to us, and that's the purpose, and an unbeliever who does not. So I don't think it's any more complicated than that. And Belial, by the way, is uh, essentially a name for Satan. That's who we're talking about. It was popularized in that intertestamental era uh, between Malachi and Matthew, and it's a very common expression in the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example. But just understand, we're really just talking about the chief enemy of God, which is Satan. Yeah, I like how he gives us these stark contrasts here. Uh, righteousness, lawlessness, light, dark, Christ, Satan. He says believer and unbeliever before he finishes off, but temple of God and idols. Well, idolatry was a consistent problem in both Corinthian letters. And with idolatry came a host of other sins, uh, sexual immorality being top of that list. 
the kinds of practices that went on, temple prostitution, that was part of the worship of the goddess Aphrodite. So you see that hand in hand, um, idolatry lends itself to other sinful practices. So I think that goes to your illustration of the unequally yoked. One half of the team is going to dominate. And that's what we see is the unbelievers are pulling the Corinthians towards idolatry, which was a major problem with that church. So the natural next step here in thinking, and usually what makes this a scripture, I think, that is ignored or misconstrued sometimes is this question of what do we mean by, when it gets down here in verse 17, be separate from them? Are we supposed to uh, ignore and isolate ourselves from people who do not believe in God? And if so, how does that make sense? Because Jesus did not do that. Wasn't he a friend to unbelievers? Didn't he go out there and minister to them? Yeah, and he ate, he ate with sinners, and that was an accusation leveled against him very often. So what would you say to that, that question? Um, are we supposed to isolate ourselves? I think it's just making the point that if you're, if you're in partnership of any sort like this, and you're, 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 you don't have that same balance of purpose, you're going to, at times, you're going to be going different directions. Um, sometimes, you know, as Kyle said, the context of this is talking about what they were dealing with in Corinth, which included idolatry. And so some of the Christians were trying to kind of have it both ways. I'm, I'm going to go be part of that. And I'm not really, I'm, I'm just going to be there, but I'm not worshiping. And, and that was a problem for some of the Christians that were there. Um, I know that for Christians who read this passage today, sometimes we apply it to relationships and whether that be marriage, whether that be a business partnership. Um, and so that might be where we want to talk about the application of, okay, we're not dealing with idolatry today where we're going in, where they're sacrificing meat and we're eating there. Um, so sometimes this passage is used exclusively for marriage. And yeah. I think that's an incorrect interpretation to just say, well, this is about marriage. That's not the context. But maybe we should talk about that. In marriage, um, could this be applied? Certainly. There, there could be scenarios, and, and you're right, marriage is not mentioned at all in this chapter. That's not on Paul's mind, or at least at the forefront of his mind, but there certainly could be a situation. I mean, Jesus talks about that, that if you don't hate mother, father, husband, wife, whatever, um, God has to come first, period. Uh, so there certainly is a scenario where that becomes true, where the marriage is the relationship that is unequally yoked, but no, that's not exclusively or even specifically what Paul has in mind here. But in answer to your question, John, how, how extreme do we need to take this instruction? I think Paul gives us an answer in the first Corinthian letter back in chapter five. He says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But I've written to you that you, uh, but I have written to you not to keep company with any named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. So Paul answers that extreme scenario where, on the one hand, it does seem kind of appealing to go live on a little church island um, away from the world. That sounds kind of fun. But then how am I the salt or the light of this world? How am, I, how am I saving people in that scenario? So that does answer, at least in the extreme, it doesn't mean we separate ourselves entirely and have no contact with the outside world or anyone not in Christ. But that doesn't mean a free-for-all either. I think our text in 2 Corinthians 6 gives us some parameters that when you feel this unequal yoke, pulling you away from God and into idolatry, specifically in this example, but you could put any other sin in that category, you've got a problem and you need to hit the brakes on that relationship. Again, whether it's a friendship or a blood relative or a work partnership, uh, but when you feel it pulling you away from God specifically and towards sin, yeah, that's, that's when it becomes a problem. But I also think that 
you know, Jesus was a friend of sinners. He came to save sinners. He was very pleased to welcome sinners who were open to the gospel, sorry for their sins, and wanted to put their life right with him. He wasn't necessarily there to uh, ignore their sin or, you know, enjoy lighthearted festivities with them. Um, he, he, that wasn't what he was there for. He wasn't also engaged in those scenarios and those places with those people for the purpose of friendship or, you know, uh, well, this, this is where pe- it, you know? this is where people need to understand that distinction that Jesus ate and drank with sinners. True. For, but per- he, for a purpose. Yeah. He, he's he's not hanging out at a gay bar with them, uh, partying with them. He's not engaging in sinful behavior with them. You know, we find him doing uh, an example in Mark chapter two. He goes to the house of Levi, the tax collector. And it says in verse 15 that as he was dining in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and notice here it says, they followed him. They're interested in listening to him. He's teaching them a better way. He's not condoning their sin. He's not joining their sin, certainly. He's not patting him on the back and saying, you're perfect just the way you are. He's teaching them a better way and they're listening. So yeah, he's sitting down and having a meal with them and talking to them face to face. How shocking, but he's certainly not condoning their sin or participating in their sin. Like what you said there, and they're listening because that lends to the whole not casting pearls before swine, right? He is the example of not being unfruitful with his efforts. They were listening. They were receptive. Paul, you just mentioned in marriage, and in most examples of this that I've seen out there, it's talking about, can a Christian marry a non-believer? And I've seen people say, nope. (laughs) I've seen people say, it's not wise. And for, for all different purposes. And they'll go to 1 Corinthians 7. There's lots of different uh, examples there we don't need to get into. But this is generally where I see this applied. And I don't. I agree. I don't think it stops there. Well, what do you think, Kyle? Is this also an example here for Christians not to marry unbelievers? Well, I just think it, it implies that any kind of relationship that is a strong bond, and marriage certainly could fit that description, but that's not what Paul specifically has in mind here. Uh, I I think I can say scripturally that this is good wisdom for marriage and you shouldn't marry an unbeliever, but that certainly doesn't mean, and you referenced 1 Corinthians 7, if you're married to an unbeliever, Paul plainly says, stay married. You're still married to that person if they're not a believer. So the marriage is honored in the eyes of God. So, but that's far from advising it or recommending it anywhere in the scriptures. You are much better off marrying someone that has the same life goals and eternal perspective and worldview that you have. I mean, obviously, um, as as a male, especially a young male um, or female, the the opposite sex is probably the one thing, the one person to ultimately test one's faith all the time. You're not a you're not a young male, though, are you? You're not talking about yourself, right? I'm not talking about myself. You guys well, are once compared upon a to time, me. Yeah, once upon a time. Even though we would say this passage is not, that's not, it's not what it's about. You could, you could refer to it. But if you look at just what does the Bible say, it's filled with biblical examples of men who, when they were yoked or together with women who didn't have the same background, say Samson, who, despite all of his strength, kept falling in love with the wrong women. And caused him some major problems. Or King Solomon, despite all of his wisdom, he was swayed into sinful behavior because of his, the influence of other women. Romantic attachment is, is a powerful force. And so, you know, there's other passages that we could look to to, to speak in this. Um, bad company corrupts good character, 1 Corinthians 15. So, at the end of the day, the Bible does say that it, it, it just look at the examples, look at what it says. And so if you have a choice and you're listening to this and you are deciding what you're going to do, it is very difficult if you're married to an unbeliever, not just for yourself. It's imagine pushing a boulder uphill because it's just it's yet you're not going the same direction. But it's not just you. It's your children. It's your grandchildren. And, and 
the influence of, of two people who in a normal marriage are united, not just together, but in union, in a relationship with God. And so if it's that way, uh, it's amazing what it can be. So it's, it's more difficult. That's not what this passage is about, but other biblical principles, I think, speak to that. Yeah, so you bring up 1 Corinthians, and I've got 1 John 2, um, do not love the world or the things in the world, which is, it's nice to have these scriptures in the New Testament, even though we do have, yes, like Sam, Samson, we have plenty of examples of the Israelites and foreign women in the Old Testament uh, leading up to this. The whole point there is, is dominance. But they is will it, lead us astray. Is it okay if I really, really like some things in the or world? Or if they're like, really, really beautiful. I mean, what about like Star right. Trek or Star Wars? Can I really, really like those things of the world? Like sports? Yeah. Well, if you're if you're a fan of any Pacific Northwest sports teams, it's actually been really easy for me the last couple of years to distance myself from obsession over sports. Thank you, Portland Trailblazers, for making me separate from the love of basketball. So we can easily see that in a spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, this kind of relationship, we can we can easily see a bond or this yoke. But you also mentioned lots of different relationships, friends, family business partners, coworkers, neighbors. Uh, we have lots of different types of relationships. How would you know if you're unequally yoked with one of those people, maybe say friends? How do you know if you are unequally yoked in friendship with someone? I think we like to live in a world of gray. You know, we like to, we mm -hmm. like to, to be that way where, where the Bible is well, I'm from black. Por I'm from Portland. I like gray skies. There's gray. And okay. <laughs> but that's probably yeah. more literal than you meant. A little more literal. The, the Bible is light, darkness, black, white is, is an unbeliever darkness and believer light. If that's the case, you know, Ephesians 5, 8, live as children of light. This passage is saying, hey, light, darkness, they don't belong together. So. Your question is challenging, John, because I think you're not going to go isolate yourself. We all work in jobs. That's not the point of this at all. But if you're in a relationship where because you're so close to that person, whether it be in business or friendship, you're finding that your purpose is being driven a different direction or you can't go the same direction, or you're closer to those who are unbelievers than, say, friends who are believers and you don't have an equal influence – that may be something we should think about. But, you know, the Bible is a lot more black and white where we like to live in this. Well, it's gray. We don't really know. And maybe it's something we need to think about. OK, so Paul said you can't have a friend that's not a Christian. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Kyle, your two sons on that. But you, you bring up a good point that I think is intended in this text. If you look at the context, the, the couple of verses leading up to it. In verse 11, Paul says, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now, in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. Paul is saying, my heart is wide open to you, but you aren't returning the favor. You are closed off to me. And then he talks about being unequally yoked with the world. Do you see the connection there? When your relationships or friendships in the world are drawing you away from your brothers and sisters in Christ to the point where your heart is closed to them or you are, you are shut off from them emotionally, that's a problem. So when it is pulling you towards sin, when it is pulling you towards worldliness and away from godliness, and when it is pulling you away from relationships in the church, to where your work friends, your neighbors, your school friends, or your real friends and your church friends are just on the side, that's a problem. And, and I would say this, John, to be, to be clear, we can and should build friendships, quality friendships with unbelievers, because that's how we're going to influence them. So we absolutely should do that. But I think the relationships that are different are the relationships that you have in the body of Christ. And it, Romans chapter 12 and verse 5 says, so we who are many are one in the body of Christ and individually members of one another. So the relationship that you have with your brother and sisters in Christ should be different. It should be deeper than, than with an unbeliever. And so, so that may be the real way to look at it is, am I close? Am I only close with unbelievers and influence in that way? Or do I have a different, closer union, not a friendship, more of a union 
with members of the body of Christ. And that's where the subjectiveness comes in. We hear all the time, I'm in this person's life, family member, not a member, uh, one maybe even disfellowshipped from, I'm in this person's life to be a good example. Now, that's something we say, and that's something that we, we, we mean, but what does that actually look like? If you keep in these relationships, are you actively teaching them about Jesus, or are you waiting for them to ask? Or are you just wanting them to be influenced by you? Or are you actively trying to teach them about you know, Christ continually? Are they even receptive to that? Yeah, and I think you mix different, you know, a few things in the same sentence that we should probably separate. If I'm talking about my neighbors, my friends who live around me, and being building a friendship with them, and, and my hope is that, that through that, they, they learn about Christ and they begin to that, you know, they're exposed to that. That's one thing. But you also mentioned something about disfellowship, which is a, a yeah. whole different thing, right? If, if you're talking about a, a believer who has been a member of the body of Christ, has been part of that union, but now they're willfully living in sin. Uh, and that may be another episode. To which we have a direct command yeah. against fellowship. So I think I want to clearly sure. separate yeah. that circumstance. But of course, what's the goal of that? The goal of that is to bring them back. It's not to... Uh, you're right. dead. You're dead to me, and I, I hate you. It's actually I love you, and I'm trying to bring you back. I only lump that in there because I think we naturally do lump that in there. Forty years goes by, someone's disfellowshipped from a different congregation. We don't see that necessarily the same as if someone was disfellowshipped last week from our own congregation, right? And so I only lump those in because we generally lump those in in our lives. You know, we don't create those strong boundaries and these relationships. So. I think one thing, John, that just to you know, kind of bring this to to conclusion is this imagery of yoke. Again, not a word we use all the time. It brings you back to to Jesus and and, and what he said. You know, when he talks about taking his yoke upon upon us, learning from him. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. At the end of the day. Whatever we do, we better make sure we've taken up his yoke and that we are we are going the same direction as Jesus. And that that's the best yoke example we can look at. Um, and if we're doing that, everything else should align. If we're putting that first in everything in our lives, everything else at the end of the day should be should be equal. Well, that's why I look at the concluding verse in chapter seven and verse one. Uh, chapter divisions are silly things, and you should disregard them because they are completely arbitrary sometimes. And the conclusion is, therefore, having these promises, well, the promise is in verse 18, I'll be a father to you and you'll be my sons and daughters. How great a promise is that? Could there be a better promise from God? Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. We should flee these things. I I remember one time uh, you, you get these Um, temperature checks on how worldly you are or how much you might be unequally yoked with the world in general. I remember one time just making a joke, uh, quoting something from a TV show. I won't say which one, but it's one of those that is hilarious, makes me laugh, but I kind of feel bad watching it, a little guilty for watching it. And I I made a joke quoting it, thinking no one in this room is going to get it. And someone laughed. And then we looked at each other with this look like, what are you doing watching that show? How do you know this? And then I was a little bit embarrassed, like, well, now they know what I watch. And, you know, yeah, it makes me laugh, but at what cost? It's not a good kind of humor. And I, I, I said, I got to stop watching the show. You know, maybe I've been a little too unequally yoked with the world indirectly through television. So I agree. I I don't think that this is saying we are to live in isolation from unbelievers, um, but discourage compromising with their sinful values and practices. We need to maintain our integrity and separate from the world. Here are a few things. So I just want to give uh, our audience, if you're listening, do a little self-check. Look at yourself. Who is influencing you more? Is it friends? Are you influencing them more? And ask yourself, do you talk about reference or watch movies or shows that you shouldn't, like Kyle just mentioned? Are you accepting of their bad language? Has it rubbed off on you? Sometimes it rub off on you and you actually think the words, even if you do not say them. Well, that's a, that's a symptom of actually being around people for a long enough time. 
the usage of certain words, it starts to seep in into your consciousness and the way that you think about things. Are you sharing your faith? Are they receptive to that? Or are they pushing, nudging you or pressuring you against your faith? Do you go to them for advice and do they push against your faith-driven belief in advice or are they giving you wrong advice? How do these relationships affect your kids and your family and your wife? If you keep these relationships, are you actively teaching them about Jesus? If we do find ourselves unequally yoked, what do we do? I just wanted to make one addendum. To be clear, if you are unequally yoked in the context of marriage, we're not promoting divorce. A second addendum, that if you find a relationship is pulling you in the wrong direction, uh, and maybe you need to step back from that. Yeah. This doesn't mean that you need to become mean or completely cold to that person. You still act like a Christian towards them. You still behave uh, politely. You're still cordial, you're respectful. And it doesn't mean you completely ice them and ignore their existence. But I'm not going to spend time as much time with you. I'm not going to engage. I'm not going to go do the things that we were doing together that were that was pulling me in a bad direction. Paul, steps that you think that uh, one should take or one can take to yoke those <laughs> yoke those relationships equally. <laughs> I don't know how you reverse this uh, concept, but um, to be in a right relationship with unbelievers. I think first you need to make sure that you've got good relationships with believers, good influences. So if you don't have that, if all your relationships are with unbelievers, that's a problem. If you don't, if you're not experiencing the friendships and the intimacy that you should in the body of Christ, then you're more prone to be open to the influences of whether it's your, your coworkers or good friends who don't have the same belief you do. All of us are, you know, the Bible tells us that. And if we think we're not, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. And so if you don't have a good influence and, and the best friends we have are the ones who actually challenge us when we're not going the right way who are honest with us. So if you're listening to this, do you have a friend who would be honest with you if you're not doing what you should, meaning you're not going the direction that Christ would have us to go? If you don't, maybe you should think about the relationships you're in and and not that you get out of those relationships, but you need more relationships where you're going the same direction. One of those risks of marrying someone who's not a, a believer is they're not going to drive you to be better or call you out and support and help you to be a good example. So some relationships that are unequally yoked cannot become equally yoked and your influence you might realize is negligent or uh, is uh, um, negligible. And you might, the, the answer then is essentially unyoke. You're not going to fix this unequalness. And uh, again, be kind, be respectful, be loving and cordial, but there might be some relationships that simply need to come to an end. And to be clear, I'm not talking about marriage. I just want to be absolutely clear about that. Or that's not what we're advocating here. It actually, yeah, First Corinthians 7 does the opposite. It says the example that you will be to your spouse by staying with them and being with them. And by the way, if you're listening to this, uh, and you're in a relationship, a marriage, where you're a believer and your spouse is not. Um, last season, we had uh, Paul Thompson on as in an episode, and I don't think we talked about it in that episode, but Paul Thompson's an example of that. His wife was a believer, uh, went to church for many years. He refused, and he will tell you the story that it was later in life when he finally came. So if you're in that situation, you're in it now. There is hope, and the Bible does speak to that. It's not the best situation to get into, but if you're in it, there are examples of bringing that person to Christ. So I want to make sure we leave it, because if you're hearing this, I want you to think there's no hope. There is hope, and there's many people who can attest to that. There's definitely hope, but I, but I think that you, you need to, before you get into these types of relationships, do a heart check and understand if you have the right faith to be able to be in relationships with unbelievers. Well, that's important, being honest with yourself uh, and just honest with what level of influence am I having on them versus what level of influence are they having on me? I've done this often as an illustration at at, uh, summer camp or in Bible classes. I'll have one or sometimes even two kids stand up on a chair 
and one kid stand on the floor and I say, you try to pull that kid up on the chair with you and you resist. Okay, now you on the floor try and pull them off the chair. You know who always wins? Even though it's two to one, the one person on the floor is always going to win. And which is odd because the other two have the high ground. Thank you for bringing in our Star Wars reference. But I say that's kind of what it's like. You might think you're having an influence on all your worldly friends, but the reality is they're trying to pull you off the chair and they've got the advantage. That's because it takes a lot of discipline to stay in the narrow path. I mean, take the, the fastest man in the world and handcuff them to Kyle here, okay? Who is going to dominate? Sorry. <laughs> I use you sacrificially, not me. Uh, who's going to dominate? Who's going to drag I'm someone still along? I'm still faster than you. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, but if he could unhandcuff himself, if he could detach himself from you, would he? Well, yeah, in a minute, because he, he doesn't want you to drag him along, right? And so I've seen that analogy used. Why would you drag someone, something along, you know, behind you if, if you didn't have to? And, and then we're talking about friendships at that point, so... Well, thank you, John, for that uh, it, very interesting look at, at an important text in the Second Corinthian letter. It applies to all of us how the relationships within the body of Christ and outside the body of Christ affect us differently, how we need to be honest with the level of influence we have on others versus the level of influence they have on us. And at times, that might mean severing some relationships that exist. Thank you so much, John. That's a very applicable topic. If you found any value in this episode today, we're glad you listen and we encourage you to subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Share it with others. Good job. And share it with others. <laughs> Does anyone else like craving an egg McMuffin right now? I have been thinking about eggs all episode. Really? Yolks. Oh. I just yeah. oh, okay. I, I want an egg McMuffin. Uh, now. For me, it's scrambled, so there's no yolk at all. No runny yolk? No? Are you afraid of it? I just don't like it. You don't it. like it? What about, a, what about a nice pub burger with a fried egg that just soaks Oozes down into it? all over it. No, he's not a runny My, my mom will tell you, is a, in the high chair, I gagged any time she tried to give me eggs, and that never has gone away. Unless like it's them. scrambled eggs, I can do. I like them. Anything with yolk? Do you Denver style with some uh, cheese on top? Yeah. yeah. Give me some cheese. I think that's good. Do you, do you eat pepper. eggs with ketchup? Ketchup, Tabasco sauce, all that stuff. Okay. Just no you yolk. You those up. No yolk. Okay. My daughter will have a fried runny egg on a piece of toast. Ugh. Like, that's pretty amazing, right? Well, you know what I do? Well, I like them all kinds of ways. Yeah. But when I get when I get them over easy, um, I pretend like I'm a vampire. I'll, you know, bite and just like drain, okay, the, drain the yolk. <laughs> that's, that's very graphic, right? Yeah. That's a little much.